Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier and today we're going to be having a look at an object that I briefly covered in one of my earlier grab bag videos, but which I think deserves more attention. This is an Astro Compass Mark II, and this was adopted by the Royal Air Force in the mid-1930s and by other Allied forces during the Second World War and beyond. And this allows you to determine the direction of true north via the positions of various celestial objects, stars, planets, the moon, and the sun. Now, these are primarily intended for use at high latitudes, that is, close to the poles. And there are two main reasons for this. First, the closer you get to the magnetic poles, the less accurate a magnetic compass becomes, because the magnetic lines of force start to converge and plunge downwards, meaning that if you are above the magnetic poles, uh, your compass isn't going to be drawn in any particular compass direction. The needle is going to be drawn straight down. Now, typically the solution to problems with magnetic compasses is to use a gyro compass, which is based on a gyroscope and is unaffected by the Earth's magnetic field. However, when you get close to the geographic poles, the lines of longitude start to converge and get closer together. And the faster motion of the lines of longitude beneath an aircraft causes a gyro compass to very quickly drift. And so before the development of electronic navigation aids, pilots operating at such latitudes had to depend on celestial navigation equipment like the Astro Compass. Now, relatively little is known about the early development of the Astro Compass. What is known is that it was either invented or perfected by one Philip Francis Everett, who also patented the Mark IX bubble sextant that we looked at in a previous video. Now, as I said, this was adopted by the Royal Air Force just prior to the Second World War and by other Allied Air Forces, including the United States, following the outbreak of war. And originally, these were manufactured by H. Hughes and Sons of London, but eventually a number of other firms were contracted to build them under license. And these included Horseman Gear Company of Bristol, Venner Time Switches Limited of London. They were also manufactured in the United States by the W.W. Bose Company of Dayton, Ohio, and Sperty Incorporated of Cincinnati, Ohio, as well as in Canada by the Dominion Electric Protection Company of Toronto. And as you can see, this particular Astro Compass is a Canadian model manufactured by DED. Now, the fact that this is a Mark II Astro Compass implies the existence of a Mark I, but unfortunately, almost nothing is known about that particular model, with almost every example that you will find being either a Mark II or a Mark IIA. And the Mark IIA differs from the Mark II in two subtle ways. Number one, instead of having just a plain post shadow vein, it has a cruciform one, which was apparently more sensitive at lower latitudes. And also on the Mark II, the knob for adjusting the latitude had a locking mechanism where you had to push in the knob in order to rotate it. And on the Mark IIA, this was eliminated. There are also some minor differences between the British and American made models and between the two American manufacturers. So for example, all the British and Canadian made Astro Compasses have a perfectly cylindrical local hour angle drum whereas the American version has a flared skirt at the bottom to differentiate between the scales for the northern and the southern hemispheres. Also, the British manufactured versions were intended to fit on the standard mount for the RAF-02 compass. And so the transit cases, which were made out of wood, didn't include any space for the mount, whereas the American-made versions have Bakelite transit cases and they contain enough space for a special mount that could be clipped to a variety of different fittings in an aircraft cockpit. And while the two American models are nearly identical, the Bose version will have the profile of an aircraft on the azimuth circle, whereas the azimuth circle on the Sperti version is plain. Right, so let's actually have a closer look at the Astro Compass and see how it is built and how you would use it to find true north. So starting at the bottom, we have our base, which has three leveling screws, and these allow you to level the entire instrument relative to the Earth's surface. And we have a pair of bubble levels provided to aid in this procedure. Next, we have our azimuth circle, which is what reads out the direction of true north or one's true bearing or relative bearing to true north. 
Next, we have our local hour angle drum, which is mounted on a pair of uprights and whose angle can be adjusted by turning this micrometer knob. And what this does is it adjusts the drum's angle according to your latitude and allows you to align the instrument with the celestial equator. If you'll recall from my previous video on sextants, the celestial equator is simply the Earth's equator projected out onto the celestial sphere. And now the drum itself has two different scales, one white on top for use in the northern hemisphere and a red one on the bottom for use in the southern hemisphere. And this can be turned using this other knob on the other side of the uprights. And this allows you to adjust the instrument for your local hour angle. Now again, going back to my video on sextants, the local hour angle is the angle between a particular meridian and a celestial object measured along the celestial equator. So your local hour angle is the angle between the celestial object and your particular meridian, your longitude, but the nautical almanac that you're going to be using to get a lot of your data is going to give those values in GHA, Greenwich hour angle. That is the angle of that celestial object relative to the prime meridian that runs through Greenwich, England. And so in order to use the astro compass, you need to convert GHA to LHA. And this is very simple. You just take your GHA and either add your longitude east or subtract your longitude west. And finally, we have our star site at the top whose angle can be adjusted for declination. And declination is the angular altitude of a particular celestial object above the celestial equator. And this can be used in two different ways depending on what type of object you are trying to sight. If you're trying to sight a star, a planet, or the moon, you use this just like the open sights on a firearm. You have a little magnifying lens at the back here and an open notch sight in the front, and you line those up with the object that you are sighting. And you have at the back here a pair of luminous lines to allow you to more easily align the sight at night. And just like pretty much every aircraft instrument of this period, those would have been filled with luminous radium paint. So these units tend to be fairly radioactive, but unless the paint is flaking off and there's a danger of you inhaling or ingesting it, these are typically pretty safe. And by the way, that's why this is here. This is actually a museum radiation tag and did not come with the original instrument. Now, ideally, when sighting an object, the object will appear perfectly aligned within the front notch on the sight. But this doesn't always happen. Most often, the object will actually be a little bit higher than the sight. In this case, you have to be careful about how you align the sight. You don't actually draw a line out perpendicularly from the sight to the object. You actually draw it vertically up to the object. Otherwise, you will get a significant error in your true north bearing. Now, if conversely you're trying to sight the sun, you don't want to be looking directly at the sun through the sight, or you're going to have a bad day. So instead, you use a shadow vane, which is this little vertical strip here, and you'll see that there is a translucent screen at the back. So rather than looking through the sight, you instead align the sight until the shadow cast by the shadow vane falls in between these two lines on the shadow screen. So in practice, to use this, what you would do is first you would level the base using your leveling screws and your spirit levels. Then you would go to your nautical almanac and based on your known position, your latitude and longitude, the day of the year and the time of day at which you are making your observation, you would extract your declination and your Greenwich hour angle, which you would then convert to your local hour angle. You then input your declination on the star site input your local hour angle on the local hour angle drum, and then finally adjust your latitude. And then when everything is set up, you then rotate the azimuth circle until the celestial object you are sighting aligns with the star sight. You then read off your bearing to true north off of the azimuth circle. And interestingly, this can actually be used in reverse in order to identify a particular celestial object. So say, the weather is bad and you can only see one or two stars or planets in the sky, and you're not quite sure which ones they are, well, then you can align the astro compass with that particular object and then read off your declination and your local hour angle, and then using your nautical almanac and your known position and time of day, 
you can work backwards to find out which object has that particular declination and local hour angle or Greenwich hour angle at, in that part of the world at that time of day. And that, in a nutshell, is how the astro compass works. Now, these would continue to be used well into the 1950s and 1960s until the development of electronic navigation systems like LORAN, SHORAN, or later GPS. However, a lot of pilots continue to use these as backups in northern latitudes. For example, the northern airline LAM Air, who operated out of the Paw, Manitoba, continued to use these as backups well into the 1980s. And several more sophisticated versions of the Astro Compass were developed over the years. For example, the Russian-built All Latitudes Astro Compass incorporated an electrically driven clockwork mechanism that automatically adjusted the local hour angle based on the local time, so you didn't have to continuously input this into the device. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time on another video where we'll look at yet more fun navigational instruments and other devices just like this one. Until then, I'm Jules Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.